Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Marquette University Law School, the virtual Lubar Center. I'm Mike Goucher, and this is On the Issues. Today, we're talking about the future of college sports. There are a couple of things happening right now that could dramatically change the model for college athletics as we know it today. One of them is a case that is currently before the U.S. Supreme Court, which um, is essentially centered on the NCAA's ability to limit compensation for student athletes. And then what else is happening is that there is federal and state legislation being proposed that would give student athletes new opportunities to make money from selling their name, their image, their likeness rights while they're still in college. We're going to be talking about this today with a couple of experts on sports law. Matt Mitten is a professor here at Marquette University Law School. He is the executive director of the National Sports Law Institute here at Marquette. And Professor Steve Ross is a professor of law at Penn State University, and he is the executive director of the Penn State Center for the Study of Sports and Society. Gentlemen, good to have you with us today. Good to be here. Uh, pleasure to be here with my good friend, uh, Matt Mitten, uh, second to hiring Al McGuire, I think. <laughs> Marquette's hiring Matt as the director of your nationally renowned sports law program. Uh, is probably the greatest uh, move in Marquette sports. <laughs> That's high praise, Matt. Well, <laughs> thanks, and I'm glad this is recorded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's make sure we have a public record of that somewhere, yes. Um, let me uh, uh, talk about the specifics of this, these potential changes, in a moment. But first, I want to begin with a broader question. And, and Professor uh, Ross, since you're, you're our, our guest today and have uh, agreed to join us. I'll, I'll begin with you, and, and it's really a broader question. And, and the question is this, will this summer, when we look back on it, will this summer be seen as, as a turning point of sorts for college athletics? Um, I think so, because uh, I think there's a log jam of issues that uh, will flow from uh, the NCAA case. Uh, if the court rules in favor of the NCAA, I think this will really increase the desire for legislative activity and reform uh, because um, the, uh, while you are technically correct uh, that, or that uh, the case is about the NCAA's ability to limit compensation from a antitrust perspective, the case is about uh, all the major universities agreeing among themselves to limit compensation. Uh, how this would work if, as the Knight Commission proposed, uh, these decisions were made by independent people acting in the public interest is a completely different question. So I think that uh, I think that a lot of people are not willing to compromise on things because they're hoping for some advantage from the Supreme Court. And so I think a log jam will get broken once the court decides really whichever way uh, uh, the court does decide. Professor Mitten, is, is, are we looking at a potential watershed moment for college athletics? Yeah, I think we are. You know, Steve's gone through and pointed out the importance of the um, Supreme Court ruling, which we, sh we should have by the end of June. But a wild card in this, so to speak, is, is Congress. Certainly Congress can address much issues that are much broader than the rather narrow ones, though very important ones that are currently pending before the Supreme Court. There's the policy issue of, well, what is, quote, fair compensation for, for student athletes, particularly um, football, basketball players who are largely athletes, the majority of which are, are athletes of color. That's a, a very important policy issue with the antitrust issue being, um, you know, narrower, but certainly no less uh, important. So yeah, this is going to definitely, we're, we're coming to a crossroads within the next month. And uh, what Congress does or doesn't do and what the Supreme Court does is going to determine which fork uh, college athletics takes. This has been building for a while, has it not, Professor Mitten? I mean, it's this is we, we've seen this momentum and players talking more and more publicly about the fact that they feel they should be compensated somehow for what they contribute to a university. Yeah, I think it's right. It, it, it's been percolating out there, but what has really brought it to the forefront was the uh, the predecessor case to Bannon, uh, or I'm sorry, to Alston, which is the O'Bannon case, where, where Ed O'Bannon, a former UCLA basketball player saw that, you know, everyone was making money, uh, colleges, universities, NCAA, 
uh, than the student athletes from the use of, um, you know, broadly defined, their name, image, and likeness in these EA sports games. And that led to a uh, first a writer publicity suit, which morphed into an antitrust suit, and then on to Alston, and that just keeps going down the road. So yes, the, the train has left the station and has been generating momentum for a number of years. Professor Ross, help us better understand, lawyers and non-lawyers alike, better understand what's being discussed here in the Alston versus NCAA uh, lawsuit uh, and, and case. Um, what, what, what are the key issues in this, in this case? So the, N the NCAA members uh, have gotten together uh, and they have agreed to a host of limitations on what can be provided to student athletes. Uh, and the, uh, uh, in order to do that under the antitrust laws, you cannot do that for a worthy cause. Um, my, uh, uh, my late mother was among the minority who thought that all the record companies should fix prices on what she called noise and use the profits to support classical music. Um, that is not permitted. Congress could do it as a tax, but private parties can't. So the, one of the uh, challenges is that for years, since athletics has become really commercialized about the last 60 years, major programs uh, like Penn State and Marquette and basketball use their highly commercialized surplus money to fund many other worthy causes. But that is not an antitrust defense. It might be a good public policy argument uh, for Congress. So the NCAA justifies its lit restrictions, not by what if you have, most athletic directors are really motivated by, but rather by the claim that it is needed in order to differentiate college sports from minor league sports. From a sports perspective, if you ask sophisticated sports observers, I don't think there's any question that the gap between the National Football League and even the Big Ten Conference is much greater than the gap between, let's say, Major League Baseball and Minor League Baseball or the English Premier League and the Dutch League. But the revenues, you know, 110,000 people go to what in a professional context, ability wise, would be, you know, the under 18 contest of between, say, Penn State and Michigan. And how, and so they claim, the NCAA makes the claim that this is because the student athletes are amateurs and we need to preserve this, what they call clear line of demarcation between amateur athletics and professional athletics. And so the trial, that was what the trial was about. And the district court found that the NCAA had not demonstrated that this was net, that the restraints they imposed were necessary in order to, um, in order to go forward. And so they said, you, you can't do that. And we're going to set a target that we're sort of picking that we know is clearly below the level that people would stop going to games. Um, one of the other things, as the Justice Department noted in their friend of the court brief, is that the NCAA's claim is really unusual in business. The claim is that among the attributes of your product, you know, I have a uh, I have a uh, Android phone and it has fe various features, various costs. You might have an iPhone with various features, various costs. The claim is that one of the key features is the labor is unpaid. And there's really no other market where that exists, where people, the claim is I would buy less of the product, same exact product, if I knew that the labor was paid. And that's the argument that is, is made here and is, and is before the court. Uh, is it surprising, Professor Mitten, that the NCAA uh, appealed uh, the, the ruling in, in Alston uh, versus NCAA, that, that there are some who suggest that the, the ruling was sort of a uh, uh, fairly narrow in scope and that uh, and it really the remedy wasn't something that was uh, overreaching. 
Um, is it surprising to see the NCAA so aggressively uh, take on this this appeal? Well, not not at all, Mike. Because you know the NCAA's position in this really is that, and the NCAA is in fact its member schools, the eleven hundred plus schools that have uh, grouped themselves into three different uh, divisions, and it's largely a a, a federated. Uh, governance structure, although the NCAA's amateurism principles applies across all three divisions. And at bottom, the real issue here is who is in the best position to determine um, what sort of rules are necessary to produce college sports and maintain its distinction from professional sports, as Professor Ross um, ably described. And the problem here is that this the Alston case is just one of many antitrust suits uh, there, there, that the NCAA has faced. I think in the last 11 years, there's always been a major antitrust litigation against the NCAA. And there's even been at least two cases filed after the Ninth Circuit in the Alston case. So the NCAA's concern is that individually or on a case by case uh, basis, uh, Lawyers representing particular groups of NCAA student athletes are going to claim that, well, this is an antitrust violation. And even if it arguably furthers uh, legitimate objectives, such as maintaining the distinction between uh, professional and college sports, that there is a substantially less restrictive alternative that a particular federal judge uh, can determine, and, and of course the plaintiffs get to pick the forum where they bring suit. They found a uh, judge who's very favorable to their position out in the uh, San Francisco, Oakland Bay area, that this will happen on a case-by-case basis. And there's really no predictability as to what rules are lawful and which ones are not. If all the time, it's always a case-by-case, very fact-specific uh, judicial determination. So not surprised at all. Uh, Professor so Ross, if, go, go ahead, Dave, it, please. No, I was just going to say, this is a debate that's been going on about sports since the 1950s. Um, The law was less clear then, but people had a sense of it. And the basic approach that courts take under the antitrust laws is they first ask whether an agreement among competitors has any redeeming virtues at all, or it's just a blatant price, you know, cartel. And assuming it has some redeeming features, which all NCAA regulation will have. Then there's a three-part test the court asks. Does the restriction have an actual anti-competitive effect in a real commercial marketplace? In this case, yes, it does in terms of uh, college uh, student athletes. Second, does the NCAA have a justification? And the answer for sports leagues is they almost always have a justification that's legitimate. And then the third case is the one uh, Matt Mitten just talked about. Is the restriction reasonably necessary to achieve this goal? And this is an approach which courts have used since English courts in the early 18th century. And the classic example some of your readers might be familiar with is a um, a non-compete covenant in the sale of a business. Somebody sells, you know, I own a, uh, a bakery, the Ross Bakery. It's got a good name. I sell the bakery to Matt. I can't open Steve's Bakery right next door as soon as we close. But how, how long could it be? Where's the area of jurisdiction? This is always a case-by-case basis. In 1958, Uh, There was a proposal to outlaw the baseball exemption and subject all sports to a uniform standard that was basically this standard. The House of Representatives rejected that proposal. They accepted the argument of baseball's advocates that we don't want courts doing the same case by case analysis in sports that they would apply in cases of sales of business and other commercial activities. The bill was then killed in the Senate. So we've been debating that issue since the 50s as to um, what is, uh, the question is who is in the best position to decide. The problem again with litigation is there are two choices, the, the courts or the NCAA. And that and those choices are not really ideal choices. I think you can make 
uh, good points that Matt and the NCAA has made as to why various federal judges all around the country should not be the ones to decide this. But as we've seen by the years of NCAA decision making, you make some really good arguments on why the NCAA isn't the one who should be deciding this either. And that's the policy issue. Professor Mitten, uh, what, what options are available to the to U.S. Supreme Court respecting a ruling in a, in a month or so? What, what are the options that the court could be looking at? Well, there's, you know, I would see at, at least three options. The first would be to affirm the Ninth Circuit and said, yes, they, they got it correct by applying the, you know, full three-part rule of reason. And the result is correct. Um, so that would be, you know, the first one. The, the, the second one would be um, the court could reverse it and say, going back to the only other um, antitrust case that the Supreme Court has ruled on, uh, that was in 1984. It was uh, NCAA versus Board of Regents, where there it involved something totally different. It involved an output market restraint, where at that up until that point in time, the NCAA sold all of the television rights to college football games. No individual conference or school could do that. And that was found to be an unreasonable restraint of trade. But there's language in the case by Justice Stevens, uh, who wrote the majority opinion. And he said that the NCAA should be given, quote, ample latitude to maintain the, quote, revered tradition of amateurism in college sports. So since then, um, all other federal appellate courts, except the Ninth Circuit, have applied what's kind of be known, you know, upheld NCAA student athlete eligibility rules, including amateurism rules like, like this one here. The NCAA saying, hey, we got to have this rule to maintain the amateur nature of college sports. Um, that, that those were rules were valid as a matter of law, which doesn't mean the NCAA is exempt from antitrust law. It's just once the rule is shown to be anti-competitive, which is pretty easy to do uh, because it is an agreement among schools that would otherwise compete among themselves and offer other things, for example. Um, the NCAA, if they could show that the restraint actually furthers a legitimate objective, like maintaining the distinction between college and professional sports, the inquiry ends. They win as a matter of law. That's the second approach. I guess the third one would be is the court could uphold the part of the Ninth Circuit's decision saying that any kind of NCAA or national limits on in-kind education related benefits, that that is lawful, but that the judge determining that I think was almost 6,000, you know, the NCAA could not preclude individual schools from offering up to 6,000 in cash related educational benefits per student athlete per year, that that's not appropriate for courts to effectively act as a price regulator. Those are at least the three different, and there might well you know, be others. There, there, there's a very, it, it very, issues are very complicated and based on the questioning, the judges were, were very interested in the case. Uh, Professor Ross, let's talk about the questioning for a moment, because if you read uh, news accounts of the uh, oral arguments, it was that the, uh, the justices were hammering the NCAA, but, but I think we all know that it can be a, a grave mistake to, to be reading the tea leaves of, of uh, what's asked in an oral argument. So um, what, what was your take on what the justices were trying to get at in their questions? Uh, I, I think the justices have, um, um, my experience uh, as a law clerk and studying courts is that um, uh, unlike say law professors and more like normal people, uh, ju judges, there are two kinds of cases, cases where the judge has a strong personal opinion about the merits, and then they're trying to fit that into their duty under the law, and cases where they have no strong personal opinion on the merits, and are much, it's much easier to apply settled precedents. So, you know, how the antitrust laws should be applied to American Express restraints on merchants uh, is something that you know, most of the justices, they might be consumers, but they don't really care about. So one of the challenges here is I think a lot of the justices have strong opinions on what the NCAA should be doing, but they know they can't just write an opinion. Uh, you know, Matt did not give a fourth option, which is 
you know, Justice Kavanaugh crafts a five justice majority for what he thinks is a fair payment to student athletes and what really ought to be done there. And I think everybody realizes that that's not an option. So I think what they're struggling with is how to deal with that. And they think they're also concerned about not creating a precedent that's going to mess up other parts of antitrust law by saying different things. So one of the challenges with restating the uh, Board of Regents line about ample latitude to preserve amateurism is the question is, why is the NCAA trying to preserve amateurism? And if the reason that the NCAA is trying to preserve amateurism is to maintain this product differentiation between pro sports and amateur sports, then the problem is they need some evidence that consumers really care about it. That was a major difference in the lower court opinion on the case. Uh, one uh, In the first, in the O'Bannon case, the Ninth Circuit upheld amateurism, which means athletes don't get paid. And the dissenting judge says, well, who says that if athletes don't get paid is really important to consumers? The example I give is uh, car racing. Um, there is a, uh, the technologically open wheel racing is so much faster, so much superior to NASCAR. NASCAR is wildly popular because it is marketed as stock car racing. There was actually one race in the history of NASCAR where you actually used cars that you and I could buy on the street. After that, they started changing it. There's nothing like the Toyota that is featured in NASCAR that resembles the Toyota at your dealership. But consumers think there's a difference. So the key is what consumers think. How the court deals with that while allowing, if they wish, the NCAA to have the ample latitude that Matt advocates, I think is going to be a challenge so it doesn't give every other group the right to start doing things under the guise of, well, we're doing this for good reasons. Mm -hmm. You know, what makes this all so fascinating is the timing, obviously, because we have this uh, case before the Supreme Court. And, and then at the same time, we have this new legislation being proposed at state levels and, and at the congressional level uh, that does get into whether or not college athletes could be compensated. And I, and I want to talk about this uh, uh, with both of you. Uh, uh, Professor Mitten, we'll begin with you. And let's, let's talk about what's happening at the state level. This gets into to what's known as the, the name, image, and likeness rights that a student athlete might have. What is happening at the state level and, and the timing of it, why it is so important right now? Uh, I think Florida is one of the states. Doesn't around July 1st, they would, they would have this law go into effect. I mean, the timing is a huge part of this. Yeah, I think at one point, I think I should step back a little bit and say under the NCAA's current concept of amateurism, student athletes do, in fact, get, quote, paid for their playing services. But NCAA rules would preclude any individual school from offering more than the full cost of attendance, which is room, board, tuition, books in each school. There's a couple thousand dollar amount above that, which would be travel back and forth, walking around, you know, pocket money for college students. And as well as you can win certain awards for outstanding academic or athletic achievement, which in the aggregate would add up to about almost $6,000. That's how the trial court judge in the Alston case reached that limit. You know, to go back to Professor Ross's point, she said, well, consumers aren't gonna be any less interested in college sports if individual schools did that. So that's the current cap. The NCAA has always had a rule which said, no student athlete can profit from, you know, their name, image, and likeness rights, which can be based on their athletic ability. And there's even been those who did other things. So, so Jeremy Bloom was a, um, you know, Olympic caliber mogul skier and had all these endorsements, which he used to 
finance his skiing career. And then when he decided to play football at the University of Colorado, he wanted to continue those endorsements. But the NCAA said, well, no, we're concerned that you're actually going to be, it's, it's blurring the two together. And how do we know that you're getting, you know, endorsement compensation from your skiing versus your college football career? So the NCAA has always taken a very, very strict, hard line on that. Uh, even though you can be a professional in one sport, uh, like baseball, Russell Wilson, for example, he good enough to be play minor league baseball, but retained his you know amateurism eligibility to play college football at University of Wisconsin. So these rules are really important. And one of the things you need for sports is uniform rules across the board, not only rules of the game, but also eligibility rules. And effectively, you can have in, I think there's about five or six states, their uh, NIL rules are going to become effective on July 1st. So uh, student athletes who play for schools in those states, and it could even be residents, you could be someone who's a Florida resident, plays at Wisconsin, Penn State, Ohio State. Interesting question, can they take advantage of this under these laws, which would violate NCAA rules? And if the NCAA would try to take enforcement action, say, hey, you've now professionalized yourself, there's where the quagmire comes into play. So why are other states jumping into it? Well, they don't want their member schools to be at a competitive disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis others. Like you notice it's Florida, then you had Georgia, Alabama, and they're like, well, geez, we don't want University of Florida athletes to be able to get X amount of NIL income because if we're here in Georgia, the Bulldogs, you know, players should get just as much. So there needs to be a uniform rule, but what, what's happening is more and more states, including I think most recently Ohio, all of a sudden, well, here's a bill coming forward. Um, so that's, what, that's what's happening today. Professor Ross, are, they, are these states doing this just because they, they feel this is the right thing to do or is it about recruiting? What, what is this all about? Well, I think, some, I, I think Matt's right that some of the states that have um, acted once the train was moving is because they were worried about some competitive disadvantage. Some of the, the early states, though, it was ideological. It's, it's a view that uh, the players were being uh, exploited. One of the real problems, and uh, this goes back to sort of a philosoph difficult philosophical question about, you know, uh, that Professor Mitten posed, who is in the best position to decide this? Uh, there's a wonderful scene in the movie, uh, The Blind Side, which apparently did not happen, but it could because it really reflects the NCAA. When they were investigating whether this football star who had been adopted as a homeless kid um, went to the University of Mississippi because that's where his adopted parents had gone and, and were active as athletes. And an NCAA bureaucrat um, raises the question that they wouldn't want this to be a precedent. And the notion is that if thousands of people around the country started taking in homeless kids so, the, so that there might be some advantage to their favorite alma mater, the idea that the NCAA might think this is actually a bad thing. And that is because everyone in the NCAA is so motivated by this fear that somebody else might have an advantage. Um, the current NIL debate is an example of this. And this is something where Professor Mitten and I completely agree. And we have co-authored a proposal with a retired Penn State professor and former um, uh, professional football uh, player and union leader, Doug Allen, who ran the Ant National Football League's collective licensing program. And we put forth a proposal that would put strict limits and enforcement on clear abuses when, you know, a player gets $500,000 for showing up on a Saturday to shake hands when it's really just an under the table in recruitment endorsement endorsement, but would allow universities and uh, players to jointly license their intellectual property, the player's name, image, and likeness, the university's logos, et cetera, in a way that would be profitable for everybody. And especially given how challenged university athletic programs are right now, this would be a potential new source of money of increased sponsorship opportunity for schools. But to listen to the opposition to this, ranging from, and part of it is delusion, from 
uh, one of our colleagues who's a highly regarded academic said, oh, this will give Alabama a unfair advantage over Alabama Birmingham. As if people are currently really debating between these two. I, and I spent an hour with a leading Penn State booster who was opposed to it, even though it would really benefit Penn State, because he was convinced that Ohio State might have a slight advantage over Penn State in competition for if student athletes could get NIL rights. So, so this whole debate shows the problem that the NCAA is really not capable of making these decisions. And I'm hopeful that after the Austin decision, Congress will actually look at this and they'll give serious consideration, of course, to our proposal. Uh, Professor Mitten, let's uh, delve into that a little bit further. So, so what are the kinds of things that Congress is talking about? Are, are some members of Congress looking for something that would give athletes even uh, broader rights. Uh, what's the, the 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 kind of discussion that is being held in Congress right now about NIL, name, image, and likeness rights? Yeah, and, and, and there is substantial. You know, it, to start with what you're pointing out, some and it, it, it's largely originated with Senators uh, Blumenthal and Booker. They are in favor of a broad federal bill that would provide um, not just NIL rights to all student athletes, but also things like protection um, you know, from loss of their scholarships, health care, uh, a number of other things. Whereas the other side is the recognition that, well, there, there needs to be a uniform federal law determining you know, what's going to be the scope of permissible NIL licensing, what sort of safeguards to provide abuse. Um, but, and then there's a difference of opinion, largely among Democrats and Republicans, regarding the need for a limited federal antitrust exemption. Because whatever rules would be enacted, uh, the NCAA or someone else would need some sort of authority to enforce those, to prevent, as Professor Ross mentioned, the thing where it's really just under the table payments, like the $500,000 show up, meet and, group, you know, meet and greet, well above fair market value, for any kind of an endorsement, that there's going to have to be some sort of someone's going to have, to have some authority to to, dis, to police this and discipline um, and sanction, you know, student athletes, um, schools, others who engage in this, um, and, and that's really a sticking point. You mentioned the word antitrust exemption. The Democratic side is up. Oh, well, wait a minute. We want the NCAA to be fully subject to antitrust law because they don't do anything that protects or promotes student athletes' interests other than by way of, you know, antitrust litigation, actual or, or threatened. So those are just some of the key sticking points between, um, you know, the different people with different views in Congress. How would this affect, uh, uh, two things, uh, how would this affect um, the sports? The sports is a, a, a you know, sort of a, a team thing. That's how we're, we've been led to believe that we all sacrifice for the greater good of the team. But if you start having certain NIL rights and some players who clearly are more high profile are doing better than other players, what does that do to the concept of team sports in college athletics? Professor Ross, I'll, I'll have you weigh in yeah. first. Yeah, I, I first, the premise um is uh, focused on college basketball and college football where all uh, the athletes receive the same compensation. Mm -hmm. This obviously isn't true in every professional sport where it's a team sport and players make widely differing salaries. It's not true in the so-called equivalency sports. Like, so if you're a baseball player at a college baseball team, you know, if you were a top draft pick, you have a free ride. And if you're an unproven guy, you'll get a quarter scholarship and you move up. Uh, when I was in college back in the 70s, I had a, a friend who was an intermediate runner, um, uh, struggled his first year, came out on a quarter scholarship, improved his sophomore year. And when asked if he might be getting a half scholarship, the coach just looked up and said, finish in the top three uh, in the uh, big meet again, uh, Cal Stanford meet, and you get a half scholarship. So this differentiation has always gone on. Second, um, the significant differentiators will be A, the handful of 
student athletes who are well known, and it really is a small handful, and people who are internet influencers who may not be the star player. You might have the third string linebacker, but the guy does amusing things. Uh, unfortunately, in society, as somebody who has two daughters, um, a huge differentiator in women's sports are going to be women who want to uh, appeal to 18 to 40 year old men by attractive pictures uh, that sexualize them. And they're going to be uh, really uh, popular. One of the key differences, and again, this shows the problem with the NCAA's leadership here. Uh, what you raise, uh, Mike, is a great question and concern. The proposal that Professor Mitten and I and uh, Professor Allen put forward would facilitate and direct NIL licensing into group licensing, which is what the, N the NFL has. Most uh, even NFL players make very little money from individual endorsements. I mean, you know, Aaron Rodgers and Peyton Manning aside, and, um, and they get it from the group licensing. The current NCAA proposal would not allow this sort of group licensing, we would propose it. And I could easily see, you know, a Marquette major athletic sponsor providing, getting the NIL rights for every Marquette student athlete. And then they'd all get a little piece of it. And then if there's little extra for their jersey or a little extra for an actual live appearance, but meanwhile, you're spreading this among all the student, uh, all the student athletes involved. Professor Mitten, how quickly do we think Congress might move on this? There was hope that I think it could be done by the middle of the summer, but does that hope still exist today? Well, it's hard to predict that. I've talked to um, staff members on both the Democratic and Republican side, and they're, they're saying they're going to get it done. They, they've kind of gotten sidetracked on a few things other than NIL legislation and a few things. But I think there's a recognition that it is quite important and really needs to be done by July 1st. I don't get any sense from talking to staff members that they're waiting to see how the Supreme Court decides in Alston. They, they, they recognize that NIL in, in, in the Alston case isn't going to resolve the NIL rights issue. They realize this is a separate independent issue, very important, um, hard to predict. You know, hopefully they will get it done by, um, by, by July 1st, but uh, they operate on their own timetable. Uh, Prof Professor Ross, d does any of what we're talking about make a real difference to fans? Or are they just so committed to the home team, to their alma mater, that none of this really matters? They just want to see a, their team win on Saturday. Does it really make a difference to the fans? Uh, I don't think um, NIL rights itself makes uh, will make a significant difference to most avid fans. I think it makes a difference to a lot of citizens uh, there are many people who are not avid fans who are really concerned about uh, exploitation of athletes. Um, uh, I think it will make a big difference to those schools that are unable to compete. Among the many reasons that the NCAA has uh, failed in their leadership in, in this issue is uh, a, a famous antitrust economist from the 1920s once said that the greatest virtue of a monopoly is not monopoly profits, it's the quiet life. It's that you do not have to compete. And I think that some programs will be creative and effective in working with their uh, athletes in having NIL programs that will be effective and other schools won't. And then they will blame their failures on NIL. So that's why the, the, this is happening. And, and, and so those fans will care um, uh, if, if this is happening. But uh, schools that do it right, I think, have some real opportunities. So, for example, if you think about a program that's been down for a while, the University of uh, Illinois football, they just got a new coach, a former Wisconsin coach, very successful guy. So if you think about why would a recruit come to Illinois instead of going to Ohio State or Penn State, 
And one of the reasons is you get a chance to play more. You're almost sure to be the star where you're competing against somebody who might be better for you than you at the other established schools. Another is being the star, you might have NIL rights opportunities uh, to advertise uh, to Illini Nation in a way, and you just get buried under the nine other stars and in Columbus or in Pennsylvania. And so it actually might provide better opportunities. And my bet is if that were to happen at Illinois, I'm just picking this as an example because I'm friends with the athletic director, um, a former sports lawyer, by the way, um, the, uh, then all the Illinois, Illinois fans are going to go, NIL is great. We love it because look at this recruit we got. So um, that's my sense of how fans are going to take it. Uh, Professor Mitten, and any feeling about how fans would re would react to any of these changes we've been talking about? Well, I think fans are going to be very concerned that they're at least able to offer the same thing, or their athletes can. It goes to the issue of why we need to have uniform NIL laws nationwide, because you can't have, for example, um, you know, people in one state being able to offer and get more than others. That's certainly um, going to be a factor. The thing that I am concerned about as an avid college sports fan is what effect it's going to have on team unity. Because you really, you know, the, these are largely team sports that we're talking about, football and basketball. And that concerns me, particularly if there isn't an allowance made or, you know, these group licensing deals that, you know, Professor Ross and Doug Allen and I are advocating because you're going to, you know, the top athletes might get, you know, six figures because of, you know, their social media followers, celebrity or whatever. And that might be the quarterback on the team, whereas the center snapping the ball might not get really anything but for a pro rata share of a group licensing deal. And so that's why I think the group licensing is really important so that the, the quality of the sport is maintained. But there is also the component of everyone's got to be playing, you know, by the, by the same rules. And it's going to be good for athletes. I mean, they're going to be looking at not only um, what's the academics, the athletic opportunities, what can I get an in NIL income? Some schools are going to benefit, others are going to be harmed. And there are three different divisions in the NCAA. So you might see some moving down, some moving up, which wouldn't necessarily be, you know, a bad thing. Um, there's going to be, of course, fans and supporters of Division I schools that might move down or whatever. But that's all going to be part of the, you know, seismic shift or shakeout that's going to occur. And, and uh, another part of the shakeout, and we haven't talked about this yet, but we probably should spend a, a couple of minutes on it, is, is this change in NCAA rules regarding transfers. So an athlete uh, can transfer once and become immediately eligible. Um, that's another big change. And Professor Mitten, I'll begin with you, and then I'll go to Professor Ross on that. How does that change affect college athletics as we know it? Well, that's going to be a huge one because, of course, there are scholarship limits that every school has. And I, I think it's a good thing that, that, that student athletes are going to be able to transfer to another school and have immediate eligibility. It's been kind of a hodgepodge mix where athletes in most NCAA sports could, but you know, football, Division I football, basketball, they couldn't. Uh, because coaches leave. I mean, that's a very important, probably the most important thing to a student athlete. I went there because this particular would, coach would be the head coach or position coach. And as we know, that can be a game of musical chairs. They move back and forth to other colleges. Some will go on to the pros. But there really needs to be some, again, guardrails in place as to timing on it. I personally think, you know, it ought to be, well, you got to, stick with the school for two years, unless there's exceptional circumstances where you can do it. Uh, we had an SLA program uh, last week where former Big Ten Commissioner Jim Delaney advocated that. He said, you know, yeah, let them transfer, but not just, well, you get there after two days. Well, I don't really like this. I'm ready to go or whatever. Give it a fair shot. And that has a lot of appeal to me. Professor so Ross? Um, so I think the transfer portal serves um, a number of legitimate and uh, I think there's pluses and minuses. Uh, the pluses are a student athlete who uh, goes to Penn State 
uh, is not playing at Penn State. Uh, they could uh, transfer to Bowling Green and actually have the full college experience and why they shouldn't be able to do that. Or a student athlete who is underrated and goes and plays for Akron and then they're a big star and now they could go play at Ohio State, why they shouldn't have that opportunity to do that. On the other hand, and this is what Commissioner Delaney was concerned about, is especially, and I think this is particularly true in basketball because of the nature of AAU basketball, you need to give 18 year olds they, they need to give it a chance and stay put. Um, uh, you know, that was something I used to use when my daughters were that age is I'd say, you can do this, but you're going to have to, you know, stick it out for at least six months or a year. You can't just try something and throw it away. And I worry about the impact on discipline if, and building the team and, 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 and doing stuff I note in this regard that UCLA went really far in the March Madness this year with a coach whose distinctive quality was that he got his players to play hard, play smart, and stay focused. And the idea that in modern college athletics, these are distinctive traits uh, strikes me as a cause of, of concern. Now, ironically, I'll bring it back to your prior question about NIL rights. One of the reasons that colleges can't individually do this is there's no employment relationship and no other contractual way that they can do this in the same way that pro teams could. One of the interesting possibilities with NIL rights is that colleges on an individual basis who are really concerned about using, uh, losing players could insist that if the player wants to share the logo use with the university, so if somebody comes to Penn State and you can join the group licensing program and you can wear your Penn State logo and earn money while you're doing it, you have to promise to stay here for two years or three years or whatever. And that would be a perfectly permissible condition uh, individ, you know, that as long as the NCAA is not doing it, each school could do it. Now, Marquette could decide we want to get everybody, and if they leave, they leave, and maybe we can, you know, get a student, uh, an athlete from a, uh, another program that way, uh, or maybe Marquette will stick with it, and Creighton will decide they want to compete with Marquette by offering more favorable terms. But it's another way to um, uh, provide a little more flexibility here and, to, and a little more options for student athletes. Let me bring this uh, full circle. We'll go back to the beginning here and, and ask uh, each of you just to, to comment on this. Um, are we, in some respects, witnessing the end of the traditional definition of amateurism in college athletics? Professor Mitten, I'll begin with you and I'll give Professor Ross the closing final word. Yes, I, I, I think that we certainly are because there's no question that student athletes are going to have and I be able to exercise their NIL rights to earn some income. And that's going to be, you know, not related at all to academic achievement for many, or many, but at least a select few, it's going to be well above the full cost of attendance. So yes, that's going to change. And I think it's going to be the question is what's going to continue to distinguish um, college sports, what makes them non-professional, distinguishes them from you know, other professional sports, but, but, but no question. And, you know, it's going to be, I think also um, the public interest is going to have a greater voice in determining it, whether it's going to be Congress or, or courts, basically, they're, they're going to have um, a greater say in determination than they have in the past. So I'd see those two things as changing. Professor Ross. Uh, I'm reminded of talking to a salty grandfather when it was suggested that the birth control pill in the 60s completely changed sexual mores uh, from everyone's strict adherence to uh, traditional religious views before the 1960s, which of course was not the case. Uh, a noted federal judge and former uh, college football player uh, told me that for him, college athletics was ruined in 1934 when the Minis which when no scholarships were offered, when the Minnesota Golden Gophers recruited an Iowa high school kid to play quarterback. Because in his view, what college football was about was Minnesota men playing Iowa men. 
Uh, many people thought that when you college, when athletic scholarships were offered, that was the end of amateurism because people were now playing for a scholarship and not playing simply for the love of the game. So I don't think we have ever had a uh, had a time uh, like that. Um, uh, your viewers who are movie buffs. Uh, might uh, might remember this great old movie, Chariots of Fire, uh, that involved the Olympics, where one of the claims was paying a coach, a wealthy athlete who paid a coach, was violating principles of amateurism by getting this unfair advantage. This is back in the early 20th century. So I don't think there's ever been real amateurism. Uh, uh, any, uh, I don't think there's a that concept means anything. Uh, the NCAA authorizes athletes to be paid that which the NCAA says they can be paid. In that way, they are no different than the National Hockey League, which has a salary cap, which authorizes athletes to be paid what the NHL negotiates with its players, they can be paid. So uh, I don't think that's going to change. But I agree with Professor Minton. There's going to be more public interest. Uh, and hopefully, in addition to the commercial side, one of the ways that the NCAA will decide to increase its distinction between pro and, co and college sports is to start requiring all athletic programs to really give their athletes an education. And this was something that was devised as call, it calls it the, uh, uh, the collegiate model by uh, uh, my uh, law school classmate and Professor Minton's co-author, Professor Tim Davis at Wake Forest. And um, it's a great model, but it's not enforced. So I would love to see the NCAA double down on its distinction by actually making sure that athletes graduate, that they are uh, uh, moving forward and get the support they need, because that is not the way the National Football League treats, uh, treats its employees. Professor Mitten, anything you'd like to add to that? Well, it's hard to top that. No, I think, uh, <laughs> okay. you know, very, very well, very well said. And it'll be quite interesting to see how this all shakes out. But, you know, the, the, the point that I think is particularly important that Professor Ross mentioned is, you know, most student athletes, regardless of the sport, they, they, they're not going to be playing the sport professionally. If they do, they're not going to earn enough income during the time that they're doing it to support themselves and their families. So it's critically important that they take full advantage of the educational opportunities uh, and that they have the time to do it. Also, that's that's the other thing, because if as you add something like the ability to uh, earn income from licensing your name, image and likeness, that takes away time from that. So hopefully we'll see a renewed focus on um, academics, regardless of what changes occur. Professor Matt Minton is the executive director of the National Sports Law Institute here at Marquette University Law School. Professor Steve Ross is the executive director of the Penn State Center for the Study of Sports in Society. Gentlemen, really enjoyed the conversation today. Thanks so much for being with us. And thanks to everybody who tuned in today for this discussion. See you next time on The Issues.